I think it's interesting to note and people might not realize necessarily kind of the current debates that are going on even within the theology of the Westminster Standards. Uh, this is all bound up with, you know, current current discussions because there's there's two questions really. Whether you whether anyone agrees with the hypothetical universalist doctrine itself, there's a debate uh, of whether the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms would allow it. And there, there were people that held to that view at the at the assembly. The question is whether the standards themselves, you know, precluded them from holding <laughs> holding to that in the future. So that's one issue at stake. But it's interesting just to hear how Usher fits into uh, that whole milieu and the dynamic of the time. Yeah, I think he's a paradigm breaker uh, in that regard. That that he holds things that we would in some way. I went into it assuming that. You can't be both of those. Yeah. You like, uh, and and he hasn't drawn all the connections. Uh, I mean, I, I admit in the book he, he he does not address the lapsarian question, but if we infer from the statements he made, we can uh, come to an approximate suggestion that I, that I think he was super on. Hmm. So uh, Harris, in that regard, right? At least now some of the hypothetical universalists. Uh, and depending on the version, I think did move in Arminian direction. Uh, but Usher shows that you apparently don't have to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Now that that is just an issue about the decrees. Uh, can you be orthodox on the decrees uh, and fit within, you know, the Westminster Confession, essentially? Well, uh, yeah, it seems you can. That doesn't address the specific issue of the extent of Christ's satisfaction. Um, now, I think one of the things that's going on here is, well, there's two, uh, uh, both, uh, yeah, one of them is historical and one of them is intrinsic to Usher's theology. Historically, uh, I, Usher uh, is, is doing most of his formulation of his ideas prior to when the covenant of redemption is going to become widespread. Uh, so, John Fesco, you know, his work uh, has dated the first sort of explicit use of the covenant of redemption, 1638, uh, and in the Scottish General Assembly address by David Dixon. And it pretty rapidly becomes a, 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 a well-used category in Reformed theology. Uh, and I don't, and certainly it has resonances before that uh, and is is in the same way the covenant of works is a, is a packaging and labeling of something. It's the same, uh, I think, but the full formulation of it comes relatively near to the end of Usher's career. I mean, he's going to be in his fifties when that's uh, coming into to predominance. And he's probably already just, you know, decided most of his positions by that point and, and not, ready to to reformulate things a lot. So in the covenant of redemption, you have the covenantal mechanism to limit the extent of Christ's satisfaction. But historically, Usher doesn't have that resource. Um, So that's one aspect uh, to this. On the other hand, within Usher's own theology, uh, the, the covenant of works it plays a huge role as, you know, I mean, there's a, yeah, if I was able to get a whole book out of it, like he says a lot about it. And, and one of the things going on there is that means that a lot of Usher's theology is grounded in nature. Uh, Not, not, not in the sense of uh, lacking special revelation. That's, that's not the point at all. Uh, But in the sense that considering the way that God made the world and the way that he made this covenant with Adam, uh, that affects the way that Usher thinks about a lot of things. And God made this covenant with Adam uh, by nature uh, that included all of humanity. Uh, and so when you get to Usher's Christology, well, he makes a significant... So this is one of the other kind of ecumenical themes is the doctrine of recapitulation, where Christ, going back to Irenaeus and some, some uh, echoes of it in Anselm, Christ is rehashing the Adamic task, which we're seeing more and more in biblical theology too. Uh, I mean, big studies are coming out on, on 
you know, the, the, the last Adam theology. Um, and that's a big deal for Usher. And if you, if you lack, historically, if you lack this covenant of redemption to, to uh, shrink uh, whom Christ represents, and he is the last Adam, uh, re rehashing the covenant of works task, well, there's kind of an, an embedded idea that this is going to have some sort of universal aspect unless in, until you get that uh, limiting mechanism, which he doesn't have. Uh, so I think the fact that he prioritizes the covenant of works so much is in one way what uh, pushes him into this hypothetical universalism because he does change his mind about it. Uh, early on, he held to a particular position. Uh, as Richard Snotty has demonstrated, he changed his mind sort of mm. uh, relatively recently before the Senate of Dort. Um, and if, if you're working uh, with the covenant of works, a natural category, uh, in terms of that it, it relates to nature uh, and all of nature as such, well, that's going to be where his Christology kind of drifts if he's if he's uh, integrated and consistent throughout it. 